Hello and welcome to this video on the Marxist and neo-Marxist perspective of crime and deviance. As a brief reminder, for traditional Marxism and indeed for neo-Marxism, both these perspectives are of a conflict nature and at their heart they have a set of very key and important beliefs and these must not be confused. Firstly, Karl Marx, Marxism, his ideology, and Marxists, those who follow him, are anti-capitalist. The Marxist perspective is a critique of capitalism, an evaluation of it. It studies and identifies how capitalism operates. Marxists ultimately desire the overthrow of capitalism. Their aim is often to replace it with communism. Focusing now, however, on the traditional Marxist view of social class and its relationship to crime, Marxists agree with labelling theorists that the law is enforced selectively against certain groups, and in particular the working class. Official statistics, therefore, should not be taken at face value, Marxists would argue. However, Marxists believe that the role of capitalism needs to be considered in the creation of laws, law enforcement and offending. Capitalism is characterised, let's remember, by property being owned privately by individuals and individuals buying and selling goods within a free market. Capitalist society is divided into social classes, which is a product of its economic model. Firstly, you have the middle and upper classes, who own most of the property, and the working class, who own little or indeed no property. The middle and upper classes are referred to by Marxists as the bourgeoisie. These are the employers who own the means of production, the things you need to make goods and services, such as land, factories, machinery, offices, etc., and who make a profit by exploiting the workers for their labour. The working class is referred to by Marxists as the proletariat, they do not own the means of production and have no other form of income. Therefore, they are forced to sell their labour, that is, their time and their skills. Work under capitalism, however, is generally poorly paid, unsatisfying, alienating and something which the workers do not control. And this ultimately is going to lead these two social classes to conflict. Within traditional Marxism, Marxism should be understood as a structural theory, that is, it looks at the whole of society and how it shapes and moulds individuals. It is also, therefore, a macro approach. Marxists see society as a structure in which the economic base, which is the capitalist economy, determines the shape of the superstructure, that is, the institutions that make up our society. Their function is to serve the interests of the ruling class, that is the bourgeoisie, and maintain the capitalist economy. For Marxists, the structure of the capitalist society we live within explains crime, and their view consists of three main elements in this regard. If we need to visualise for a moment the base superstructure model, we might look at an example such as this, and you may want to pause the video now to copy this out. As we can see at the bottom, we see there is a base, and this would be capitalism, whereby we have the relations of production, the bourgeoisie exploiting the proletariat, and the means of production, the things you need to produce goods and services, which is owned by the bourgeoisie. This economic base shapes the superstructure, which is projected on top. And the superstructure is made up of all of those institutions that make up our society, such as education, the family, religion, mass media, politics, so on and so forth. The superstructure maintains and legitimizes the base. It makes it appear normal, natural and unchanging. Firstly, Marxists would argue that capitalism is criminogenic. For Marxists, crime is inevitable in capitalism because capitalism is criminogenic. By its very nature, it causes crime. Poverty may mean that crime is the only way the working class can survive. Crime may be the only way they can obtain the consumer goods they are encouraged to buy by capitalist advertising agencies. So this might help to explain things such as theft. 
alienation and a lack of control over their lives may lead to frustration and aggression, resulting in non-utilitarian crimes or crime without a purpose, such as violence. The need to win at all costs or go out of business, along with the desire of self-enrichment, encourages capitalists to commit white-collar and corporate crime, for example, tax evasion. So here we're thinking about the bourgeoisie. David Gordon argued that crime is a rational response to capitalism and is thus found in every class. Next, the state and lawmaking. Unlike functionists who see the law as reflecting a value consensus, Marxists see lawmaking and enforcement as only serving the interests of the capitalist class. So maybe perhaps we can think about the work of Louis Althusser here and how the state is run by the bourgeoisie and is split into various apparatus. Chambliss argued that laws which protect private property are the foundation of the capitalist economy within which we live, and it favours the bourgeoisie. An example he would draw upon is from our colonial or imperial past. English law was introduced to East Africa during the imperial period, where there was no money economy, but also the population did not wish to work for the British. Therefore, the local or new government introduced a tax which had to be payable in cash. If you did not pay, you would be punished. And this resulted in the creation of a new workforce for the capitalist plantation owners, because the locals now had to pay this tax, therefore had to work for the British, or else they would be punished. Snyder argues that the capitalist state is reluctant to pass laws that regulate the activity of, of business, in particular, obviously, the activities of the bourgeoisie. And so what we're seeing here is profit being placed before people. Thirdly, selective enforcement. Marxists argue that although all classes commit crime, when it comes to the application of the law by the justice system, there is selective enforcement. And again, we may want to consider that the justice system is probably controlled by the bourgeoisie, or so Marxists would argue. While powerless groups such as the working class and ethnic minorities are criminalised, the courts tend to ignore the crimes of the powerful, that is the crimes of the bourgeoisie or white-collar crime. Marxists also argue there is an ideological function of crime and law. Pierce argues that laws that appear to benefit the working class often benefit the ruling class too. An example that is often given of this is health and safety, which laws were introduced in this area throughout history, but primarily over the last 20 or 30 years or so. And whilst on the surface it may appear that that's a positive thing, protecting workers, you could also argue actually it's a way of trying to keep workers fit and healthy so they continue to work for the bourgeoisie. Furthermore, because the state enforces the law selectively, crime appears to be largely a working class phenomenon. So white collar crime or middle class crime is often invisible. This divides the working class by encouraging workers to blame the criminals in their midst for their problems rather than capitalism. So the primary targets of working class criminals are the working classes themselves. is a way of dividing the working class, preventing them from forming a unitary front and confronting capitalism, which is their prime oppressor, Marxists would argue. In terms of the evaluation of traditional Marxism, traditional Marxism shows the link between lawmaking and enforcement and the interests of the capitalist class. By doing so, it puts into a wider structural context the insights of labelling theory regarding the selective enforcement of law, and thus is very useful. However, it ignores largely the relationship between crime and important non-class inequalities such as gender or ethnicity. It is too deterministic and overpredicts the amount of crime in the working class. It's worth remembering that not all poor people commit crime despite the pressures of poverty. Furthermore, not all capitalist societies have high crime rates. We can compare, for example, Japan, which has a very low crime rate and yet is an advanced capitalist economy, with the United States, which has a very high crime rate and is also an advanced capitalist economy. However, Marxists point out that societies with little or no state provision, for example, the US, tend to have higher crime rates. Left realists argue that Marxism focuses largely on the crimes of the powerful and ignores intra-class crimes, where both the criminal and the victim are working class, such as burglary, which cause great harm to victims. And indeed, we generally find, if we look at statistics, if we are to trust them, that is, that the biggest victim of working class crime is the working classes. Next, we have the neo-Marxist approach, which is a form of critical criminology. 
What does this mean? Well, ultimately, neo means new. This was an attempt to update elements of traditional Marxism and to broaden out the criminological debate within sociology about how perhaps crime and deviance should be dealt with and how it can be explained. It is primarily based on the work by Taylor, Walton and Young, who put forward what is known as the new criminology. Taylor and others agree that with traditional Marxists in many ways. So, for example, they would argue that capitalist society is based on exploitation and class conflict and is characterised by extreme inequalities of wealth and power. They also agree that the state makes and enforces laws in the interests of the capitalist class and criminalises members of the working class. They would also agree that capitalism should be replaced ultimately by a class of society which would reduce the extent of crime or even rid society of crime entirely. So they're buying into to an extent that idea that capitalism is criminogenic. However, the views of Taylor and others are also different and they differ significantly from those of traditional Marxists and this is going to be the focus of our study now. Taylor and others believe in anti-determinism. They argue that traditional Marxism is deterministic. They reject theories that claim crime is caused by external factors such as subcultures. Instead of being driven to crime by economic necessity, they see crime as a voluntary act, that people are choosing to do this themselves and that it is often politically motivated. The proletariat or proletarians or proles as they're simply referred to sometimes are not puppets of capitalism therefore, but actually agents of its change. Taylor and others share with traditional Marxism the goal of a classless socialist society and social equality, but they also emphasise the importance of individual liberty, that is freedom, and diversity, that is difference. They argue that individuals should not be labelled deviant just because they are different, as in a capitalist society. Instead, individuals should be free to live their lives as they wish and to define things as they so desire. They create, therefore, what is known as a fully social theory of deviance. Taylor and others aim to create this fully social theory of deviance, which is a comprehensive understanding of crime and deviance that would help to change society for the better. This theory would have two main sources. Firstly, traditional Marxist views on the unequal distribution of wealth and the power to enforce the law. And secondly, the ideas from interactionism and labelling theory of the meaning of the deviant act for the actor and society and what effect this has on the individual. The fully social theory of deviance has six layers to it that they would argue needs to be considered when dealing or thinking about crime and deviance. We need to understand, they would say, the wider origins of the deviant act, that is, the unequal distribution of wealth and power in capitalist society, and this will have some explanatory power. Next, the immediate origins of the deviant act, the particular context in which the individual decides to commit the act. This also will have explanatory power for why the act was committed. Thirdly, the act itself and its meaning for the actor. So, for example, was it a form of rebellion against capitalism? Again, there would be explanatory power here to be considered. Fourthly, the immediate origins of the social reaction, the reactions of those around the deviant. So, for example, the police and that person's local community in discovering that deviance. How do they respond? Again, further explanatory powers here. Fifth, we need to consider the wider origins of social reaction in the structure of capitalist society, especially the issue of who has the power to define the actions as deviant or criminal and why some acts are treated more harshly than others. Further explanation can be acquired through doing this. Finally, and sixthly, the effect of labelling on the deviant's future actions. So for example, why does labelling lead to deviant's amplification in some cases, but not in others? All of these combined would have strong explanatory powers for why these acts of crime and deviance occur and would grind it or ground it into a lived social reality. However, we of course need to evaluate the neo-Marxists and their ideas. Feminists would criticise neo-Marxism for being gender blind and focusing excessively on male criminality or male working class criminality at the expense of female criminality, whether working class or otherwise. Left realists criticise neo-Marxists in two ways. Firstly, by saying that critical criminology almost romanticises working class criminals as Robin Hoods, who are fighting capitalism by redistributing the wealth, that is, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. 
However, in reality, as previously stated, these criminals simply and often prey upon the poor themselves. Secondly, Taylor and others do not take such crime seriously and they ignore its effects on working class victims. And perhaps we should be considering the victims ultimately. Burke argues that critical criminology is both too general to explain crime and too idealistic to be useful in tackling crime. However, Stuart Hall and others have applied Taylor and others' approach to explain the moral panic over mugging in the 1970s. That's it. Thank you very much.